Welcome to Founders Club, the show for real estate entrepreneurs. My motto is you got to be a landlord before you own a Land Rover. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Welcome to another episode of Founders Club. Today I'm at Story House Spirits in San Diego, and we're going to be talking to Mark Pattison about how he started in the business doing nine deals a year, and now he runs a team of seven doing 250 deals a year, how he manages everything. Utilizing free resources, don't think everything you have to do is cost money. Yeah, there are some things that are not as expensive that are actually better. All his favorite tools and systems and how he works Facebook and his sphere of influence to gain a massive number of referrals. Looking forward to jumping in. So sitting here with Mark Pattison, very excited to have you on the show today. He's a top producing agent. I want to kind of dive in with you, get to the nitty gritty. Like you did over 30 deals in one month, which is really unbelievable. I think a lot of agents would aspire to do that kind of business. So I want to talk today about kind of how you do that, how you manage it, the tools and systems that you use. But first kind of, why don't you just tell me a little bit about what that month was like? Yeah, so uh, I think we did 31 in March. So it was one a day, 30 in March, yeah, 31. Um, and so just the basics is just, you know, it's all about the month prior or even two months prior and it's all about prospecting. So if you're not prospecting, if you're not making the dials, if you're not doing the open houses and you're not doing the follow up and providing value, you're not going to have a stellar month or a stellar two months later, you know? So what, what are you on pace to do this year? I would say, um, I think we've closed, I was trying to look before, but my sheet wasn't working. Um, I want to say we've closed a hundred. 100? Uh, 100 deals so far this year. We're closed and pending. Um, and so we're probably on track to do 250. That's great. Yeah. So that'll be a big year. That'll be the biggest year ever for you, correct? Yes. Yeah. My uh, Two years ago is when I started my team. We did 73. Last year, we did 116. So we're almost to our last year's mark. Wow. Um, and this year, we'll do 250. So growing by double almost every year. So you almost doubled. doubled. What, what would you say is the cause of, of how you've been able to grow so fast? I would say finding your key players. So, you know, when you're having a team or if you're a solo agent, finding what you're good at. So for my example now is with my team, I got to find the ones that are good and know what they're doing. Um, I also have to provide my team value so that when they get good, they don't leave. So right. that's what I've just been really focusing on. And I, I had this mindset of like growing so that we could do massive amounts of numbers, but it almost becomes too much to handle and unattainable. So I right. went really big. And then I kind of went back down to a a smaller size. So for the last like three or four months now, we've been a really small team. So how many people are currently on your team? We have seven agents. Seven agents. Yeah, seven agents and one admin staff. That's our transaction coordinator. Okay. And so how does that, um, how does that break down? Is there like different responsibilities for different agents or how do you set that up? Yeah, so we, um, some teams will be like listing side, buyer side. There is definitely a different personality type for that. Um, but with us, what we do is we'll have someone go on and start our team. They'll be starting with buyers after they've done six transactions. We allow them to start studying listings. And then once they pass the listing, uh, kind of the listing presentation, listing console, we'll let them take on listings. So it's really, you can do buy side or listing side. Um, and I don't take all the listings. I actually don't like listings. So I'm probably the only team leader you'll ever meet that doesn't like to have listings. Yeah. And I always thought that people thought I was, or I always thought I was crazy because I didn't like them, but. Do what you're good at. So just so I'm hearing you correctly, you have seven agents and they kind of are split between buyer's agents and listing agents? For sure. Well, they're all buyer and listing agents except for maybe one right now. Okay. One or two have all had one maybe hasn't had a listing before. Cool. Um, The rest have all had listings. And so and then when they come on your team as a new member, then they're going to start buying. They do six transactions. (coughs) Then you said they can study listings. Yes. What, what does that mean? So I'm a nerd when it comes to figuring out processes and I always want everyone to do the exact same thing. So with our buying process, everything is the exact same throughout every single transaction. Why throw in like curveballs when there's already gonna be a curveball with the real estate transaction? Just make everything else the same. Right. Um, and I can go through the buyer process. And then for the listing stuff, we actually have an online portal that it makes it so that if you're a new agent, you do six transactions on my team, you then go to our online portal and start studying the listing side. Um, before you do the buy side, there's also a buyer section as well. Okay. And you just do it, everything that we do, and it's textbook. So it's, you know, for the buy side, once you get an escrow, 
the admin schedules your inspection, they contact the buyer. At the inspection, you review the disclosures with your client right there in person. Then you walk around with the inspector. We do the exact same thing every single time. So okay. it's very cookie cutter. After that happens, you walk around, do your AVID, and then you walk out and you're done. Um, you send an email to the admin and say, hey, I reviewed everything with the buyer. We're good to go. And here's very my cool. AVID. So that you're not like, oh, I'm the 29th day of escrow. Oh my gosh, I didn't do my AVID or whatever right. the heck you even call it. Yeah. Um, oh, I didn't do it. No, you did it because you were there at the inspection. Right. It just happens and then it makes everything super streamlined. So I want to get back to the processes in a minute because I think that can help a lot of people. And I think that's something that you are really good at. Um, but tell me about this online portal that you just mentioned. You said they go into the online portal. Yes. What, what is that? So it's free. It's called Adaptive U. If you Google it, and the U is just literally like a U, like university. Um, and you go on there, you can create an online class. And people have to pass classes. So you go through it, and then I give them tests. So I would say at the end of every single mm. meeting, I say, which test do you want to take? I already have tests created. So it's like, you know, the contract. So I want to know everything about the RPA. You better know that paragraph 14B is where the, all the timelines are. Because if you don't know that when you're wow. selling a buyer... You got to have that down. Yeah. Uh, you know, allocation of cost, paragraph seven. You got to know exactly where, what's normal for buyer, what's normal for seller. Uh, what is a transfer tax? How does the, how do you calculate that for the buyer? That's um, great. Is it normal for the buyer to pay? Is it normal for the seller to pay? So you do all of that on this onboarding process, and you even do it for agents that are experienced if they join my team, just because mm -hmm. some agents will say, "Oh no, that's that." I'm like, I don't think so. I think you're wrong. So I I always make sure that new agents and experienced agents, if they're joining my team, mm -hmm. go through this same kind of the classes. classes. Very cool. And it's all online so that and I don't so have to sit there and hold Did you hand. create all these classes? I did, yeah. So you created the classes, and how many are there There's roughly? probably like 20. 20 classes. Yeah, videos, everything. Um, and so we go on and we say someone asked me a question, I would just video myself, upload it to YouTube, upload the link there, or upload it to our Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And then we have a private Facebook group between the team. And then we would upload the link to the portal. So then they just click Love on that, that, and it says, how do you do a buyer consult? Then there's a video of me doing a buyer consult with a buyer. That's great. So, and then they just sit there and watch that video over and over again. Until it's uh, in Yeah, exactly. So they'll listen to it in their car. They'll, you know, and so they're hearing the audio on repeat. Mm, that's really smart, man. That's really good. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and I love the idea that you can test them. How does, how does the testing work? So they watch a module with videos. Yep. And so, then at the end, they have to pass or fail? Yes, yeah. So I'll, I'll do a paper test. So I, it's not, you could do testing on there, like if you paid for the upgraded version, but I like to keep my costs very low. Mm -hmm. So I have the free version of Adaptive View. Um, so at the end of a meeting, I'll just say, hey, you know, and right now all my team's pretty trained up, but one of the things that we're going to train on this week is um, we're doing a lot of listing side stuff, but I'm doing a 203K loan. Okay. And I've never actually done one before. Okay. And I'm representing a buyer and we're doing that. And I just got a buyer offer accepted about 20 minutes ago and we're doing that. Awesome. So I'm going to teach the team Congrats. what that actually means because I'm learning it right now. So as you're going through, you're adding more content all the time. For sure. Yeah. So then I will then create a test for a 203K, you know, kind of how to do that loan or what you need. Mm. And then I'll have everyone test. And then once someone tests on it and they force themselves to study because it makes them say like, I got to know this stuff. Right. Um, you know, it's pretty ingrained. And then they go out, That's like, if you ask any one of my agents about a 1031, they'd be like, oh, 45 days to locate, 180 days to close. You can do a 200% rule or you can locate three properties. Every single one of my agents is going to know that. And they know it. Like, yeah, yeah. and they know the, the 1031 exchange rep. It's in their phone. So if they ever get it there in a listing, oh, I got to do a 1031, what are the rules? They're not like, uh, right. no. They've been you already know them. the rules. You know you who know to everything. talk to. And you don't have to be the expert, but you got to have the basis. Right. Like you got to have the little bit of it down and then you got to have the people that you can call. You got to know enough to be dangerous. Yes. <laughs> or to know enough to be, act like you know what you're doing. Right. But don't lie. Right. That's what I always say. Like, don't lie. If you don't know, tell them you don't know. It's, it's, it's actually very interesting, that approach, because something that we, me and Sam talk about <laughs> all the time is like the lack of real quality education in real estate. For I sure. think that like even getting tested, it just seems like the stuff you're tested on is like so out of date and so not relevant to the business. When you're talking about 1031 exchanges and how to do a listing presentation and what's on what's up with the contracts and this and that, the stuff that you're actually using For sure. and you're just adding that missing piece and you're able to train and keep talent by doing that. That's why I think my agents do so well is the education aspect, because in life, people that do well are highly educated. Yeah. Usually. It doesn't have to be across the board. I'm not saying people have their masters. I'm saying that they studied something. Right. Whether it's a trade right. and they're a plumber, whether it's, you know, a pilot, they they focused on one thing 
and they knew everything about it. Those are the people that do really well in life. Totally agree. Totally agree. So because it's a profession, right? Be a professional, act professional, and know know your stuff. Yeah. I and mean, it's a pretty simple formula. For sure. And I think just like having your clients back, knowing exactly, there's nothing worse and it creates anxiety. Like if I didn't know the answer or if I didn't know where the question was gonna come from next, it would always give me anxiety. So I'm like, I'm just gonna know everything. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna try to learn as much as I possibly can about real estate and study, study, study. Are you an analytical? No, I'm not. I actually no. have like no C at all. And really? I'm, yeah. So the disc profile, I have like zero C and I'm kind of weirded out by it because I feel like I'm just a perfectionist, but I think it's more of, I went to a private Catholic school okay. and the nuns would beat me. So that's interesting. They made me, uh, based on everything, what you're <laughs> saying, you sound like, I think they forced me to be prototypical analytical. analytical. Yeah. No, I'm not very organized. Like if you go to my desk, my desk has like stuff everywhere. I'm totally like CEO, messy. Interesting. Need, I need a rock star assistant that can like organize my life. Make sure the trains run on time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I'm never late. Never. I like do. I don't know. It's like the things that I've you're trained on. Mm -hmm. I can learn those things. So yeah. I have, everything is a forced analytical. Yeah. Being late is is an easy one. Picking up the phone when it rings is an easy one, right? There's yep. certain things that you just, you just do. can do that are you know separate you from everyone else in the business, which is kind of wild. Uh, so tell me about so the 250 that you'll do this year. What of that is your production versus the team production. Yeah, so I'm probably like, out of seven, I'm probably like fourth or fifth. I'm bad. In terms of volume? Yeah. Or number of deals? Okay. I, I think I'm in like fourth place right now. Okay. Um, so my agents all beat me. Wow, uh, good. But they, yeah, I definitely am not someone who wants to be the one that's like the team leader, the one doing the volume. Right. I actually don't care to do that. Um, so like Ali on my team, Josh on my team, who else, Joe. Joe's brand new and he's done like 15 or something. That's and this great. is his first year. So they're killing it. What is your role with them? Is your role to provide leads and training and guidance? Or what, like, what is your... For sure, yeah. So we, uh, I like to think of our team more of as a family. So yeah. because, like I said earlier, you coach people and then you either coach them out or you coach them up and out. So my thing was, hey, let's turn this into a process where we become a family and we work together for the rest of our lives or on some aspect or another. So how do I get it where people don't leave? So I've Love never that. had anyone like a high agent ever leave me because I've really planned it to be more that we're a family and we take care of each other. I don't want to get rich off my agents. I want to make my agents rich. Yeah. I want to take over. Like I said, I moved to Kensington. I was like, let's take over Kensington. Let's like yeah. change the neighborhood and totally. not saying in sales, but right. like you know, just the people that are there. It's like, let's, let's just change it up. Let's bring yeah. some new agents in yeah. here. And, uh, and honestly, fun. I think that's a critical part of being a good leader. Cause something you just said, that's so important is as a leader, to be a good leader, you've got to bring your people up. So many people, they want to be like the star of the show and they kind of have people that help them be the star of the show. And then there's really great leaders like yourself that are all about empowering the team and are okay with their agents doing more business than them. Because for you, it's more about how do we all rise together? Yeah, there's a girl on my team. She'll sell 60 houses this year. She put her wife through college. They're having a baby, like in a couple weeks. Amazing. Uh, she bought her first house and investment property. She bought a triplex. She's buying another one. Like she's killing it in life. Yeah. And the coolest thing about it, she traded her BMW in for a cheaper car. So like, because wow. I've brainwashed them. That's good like, discipline. So my biggest thing is you have to have, like don't buy a new car if you're on our team. New cars won't sell you houses. Buy houses, buy investment properties. Focus on things that are gonna make Great you rich. Great motto. So yeah, my motto is you gotta be a landlord before you own a Land Rover. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love but that. But I have, I have like seven or eight tenants, so I, I bought myself a Range Rover. Good for you. Yeah, finally. Good for you. I was driving a really crappy car for like Which, five I mean, years. In, in reality, right, that's the rich dad model, right? Like yeah. buy the assets first, get the cash flow, then buy the toys. Because everyone wants, it's like that study that they did where they said, do you want one cookie now or two cookies in 15 minutes? Yeah. Every freaking adult wants that car now. Yep. They want that new pair of tennis shoes. They want their nails done. They want yep. their cell phone, but they don't want to wait one year and just bite their tongue for, you know, saving their money yep. to get a condo. Yep. It's crazy. I'm like, dude, really you buy cool, one man. condo for two fifty in Mission Valley, it'll make you $70,000 this year. Like, yep. it just goes up like crazy. Yep. And of course, I bought my first place, immediately dropped down. I bought it in 2007. Okay. And I held on to that sucker and yep. I made over a hundred and something thousand dollars and I over just time. sold it. Probably yeah. cash flow the whole time. It did, yeah. yeah. And it was tenant occupied the whole time. Right. So, so who cares what it's worth? Exactly. Like, I ready. always I always talk to clients about that or just agents. I'm like, just get in on anything, live there one year and rent it out. 
Who cares about the countertops? That's a good philosophy. If you mention philosophy. countertops to me when I'm selling you a house, I'll shake you. <laughs> <laughs> It's not I, about the countertops. I really love that. That's a great model too, honestly, to just be telling people to to stack the assets first, get the money, then get the toys. Buy all your clients, rich dad, poor dad, real estate riches. And then they start calling you and start buying tons of houses from you. There you go. There's That's a good secret. piece of advice. Yeah, yeah. there you it get, is. You get we're, hooked we're on real estate. <laughs> That's really awesome. What would you say on uh, back to the 250? What would you say is your ratio of like listings to buy side? Definitely buy side heavy. Okay. Um, probably 75% buyers. Okay. So we're a younger team. Maybe that's an excuse. I started as a buyer's agent on a team for two years, my first two years in real estate. And then I started my team. Mm-hmm. I had done one listing when I started my team. So I'm very buy focused. We yeah. definitely have agents on our team that love listings. And so when I have a listing opportunity and I know it's going to get knocked out of the park, like a referral, I'll give it to her or I'll give it to the guy, like whoever the person is. That's, so you're not that's even good. taking your referral listings. No, wow. I just gave like, I've given probably four or five of them, like from like other agents from out of town that's great. to other people on our team this year. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. So buy side heavy. Um, how are you managing all these people? How are you holding them accountable to like making the calls or whatever your guys is? Yep. So when I had my team growing to where it was like 20 something agents, I was, uh, you know, holding them accountable, doing a huddle in the morning, doing a meeting every week, doing, hey, why aren't you in at the office at 8 a.m.? You know, babysitting Mm -hmm. when I decided, hey, this is not the route I want to go. You either want to be on, you know, be on the ship and like become rich. So you manage your own schedule. You do your own thing. Mm -hmm. We don't do a huddle anymore. We do a training every week or every other week. Um, It's suggested that you come. Nothing's ever mandatory. And there's no accountability. So if you want to make money, wow. if you don't and you're around us, you're going you're gonna to leave the team because you're around a bunch of people who are just starting to get rich. And So how are you tracking their production or if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? Or are you just not All up to them. and giving them time? And if after 90 days they don't have the numbers, then... Yeah, so I'm not recruiting anyone. So there's no one is allowed to join my team right now. Um, so there's definitely no like 90 day period right now. Everyone that I have, my seven, I'm sticking with. So there's no okay. they're no adding, there's no subtracting. The people that are there, are there. So you have so. your core group set up and that's... That's it. You're going to ride with them for a while. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I was doing the 90 days, no sale, you're gone. Uh, CTE, which is uh, Continuing Excellence, I believe it stands mm-hmm. for. They log their numbers. They log their calls. you got to have $100 minimum every day, blah, blah, blah. And you stopped all that? Stopped all of it. I just basically said, hey, do you guys want to You guys want to do what it takes to become rich if you are on that same ship? And then the people who I didn't invite to the team version two were people that I felt that weren't committed. They were just interested in real estate. And I just Love wanted that. people that were committed. So you downsized your team. Start, you were at 20, now you're at seven. Yes. How did you determine who was gonna make the cut and who wasn't? Interested versus committed. So biggest was um, you know, personality types with blending because you never know people's work ethic when you start out. Right. And then once you kind of see what's going on, um, also conversion, like if you're not converting and if you're not knocking it out of the park every time, um, it's not that I like didn't, invite them but it was more that it was just they, i think they kind of saw it so was it like you looked at your roster and the seven people at the top are the ones you're taking or what? no i uh took my top agents and i asked who would you take if you had to have a team that you knew everyone had their back who would you take and i knew that there was a certain amount because of coverage for right. leads and yep. other things that we had to do mm-hmm. um, so i knew that there was an amount that i had to have but i mean there was times when i'd have like a low newcomer and i would be giving them a layup to try to help their career start off. Right. When I should really be giving the layup to the top dog who's, who's going to close, close 60. Yeah, yeah, and they deserve it. Right. So that's who I, you know, I, I started seeing that I wasn't paying enough attention and 20 people or even managing over 10 for me was too much. So you let these 13 people go? Yep. How was that? Uh, it, it was fine. Yeah, I didn't have any like backlash. I just kind of said, hey, look, I'm either going to have a breakdown and then you know, like the whole thing's going to be gone or I'm just going to like just train I, I i basically turned it into where i'm just coaching so it's no longer like a team i'm more of the, like i said the family model where we just Got take it. care of each other mm-hmm. so they're not relying on me for everything whereas i felt like everything was on my shoulders so now all you're doing is one training a week um yeah and it's been almost every other week except for this week because we took sharon's listing presentation thank you sharon it's the best listing presentation you can possibly have it really is uh we took that and we've been dissecting it every single week so we're listening to the audio that i have from when i was in south carolina uh, no, wait, I was in New Orleans. I listened to, we went and saw Sharon there. 
um, and I have all of it typed up, and we've been reviewing that every single week. It really is unbelievable. Yeah. What would you say from that was the big was the biggest difference maker? Uh, a lot of pre-listing stuff. It's great, right? So making sure that you have all the stuff done prior, so that you're not you know showing up to the house like, oh my god, I haven't confirmed with this person. There'd be days when I'd show up to a listing presentation and I'm like. What's the address? What's the name? What's the name of the person? Yeah, and I love how he talks about um, asking them if they opened it, and like either way, they say you're gonna give basically the same answer. I love people that break the rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You and I are gonna get along right. Yeah, we're gonna be just fine. Yeah, I like you. I like you. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, before we get too far, I want to give a shout out to Storyhouse Spirits and the I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this U I N T A. The West Coast style IPA, it's actually fantastic. And Mark ha is having the I think it's just house, uh, yeah, house the vodka, house vodka soda. Which they brew right there behind us in this really badass distil distillery. Anyway, if you guys like the show, give us a like, give us a comment. If you have any questions for Mark, um, just reach out. I'm sure he's happy to answer them as well. And um, we'll, we'll keep, keep on rolling. So tell me about, tell me about the beginning. Tell me about how you got started. I uh, started real estate. I was um, I moved to San, Di San Diego for my real estate license. I didn't know a person here. I just moved here for the weather, and I said <laughs> I'm gonna move here. And um, my brother said, "Good luck. You're not gonna you're not gonna succeed in real estate." And so now wow. every time I have a closing, I take a picture of the check and I send it to him. Oh my god, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I definitely am not the nicest to him, but. Hey, I, that like digged into me where like someone says you're not gonna be able to do something. Totally. So I started real estate. And not to cut you off there, but an interesting thing about being an entrepreneur is how sometimes like the people closest to you are gonna be the biggest haters. Yeah. Which was a big adjustment for us at first too, is just dealing with that like negativity and just pushing through and just seeing your vision sure. and just. Well, and I didn't have the like horns. the best track record. I think I worked at Microsoft for six months. I got bored. I was just saying, like, the corporate world just was so boring to me. Right. So that was my first job out of college. I worked for Groupon as a startup, got bored. It was just very, like, stagnant, and mm -hmm. I just wanted something. And Groupon was something. It was a brand-new startup, so it was like, go, go, go. Totally. And I still was bored. The thing I love about real estate is there's, like you said, always something to learn. Mm -hmm. The education process, I think, is huge, and I think that's done why I've done so well, is I, I just want to know more. Like, I want to know more information. Now, I mean, think about it. You can learn about apartments. You can learn about, yep. you know, like commercial you can learn yeah. about multiplexes you can learn about whatever you want yeah, short sales wholesale yeah, this, like, that, the other I, and i don't know anything about half those things yeah i know like 10 percent of what you can learn in real estate and i think that's why i've kind of loved doing it it's just, just like the constant education aspect constantly growing and yeah. getting better constantly and... improving yourself yeah um and so that's where i started was just as a buyer's agent on a on a team here in san diego worked for him for two years and he was like hey you're doing so well you should start a team um and started up a team kind of small. Hold on. I want to stop you right there. So first two years, tell me about that first two years. Yeah. So I sold, uh, so like started in August, I think. And between August and December, I sold nine. Okay. Uh, my first year sold my first house two weeks into the industry. Wow. Um, the home didn't, and this is not knowing anyone, not knowing one person met the person on a dating site and then okay. sold them a house. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> then I, then I, uh, my broker, it didn't, it didn't appraise. The house didn't. My broker was like, oh, that's never going to work. Like, no way that will work. It was a $75,000 issue on like a $600,000 home on appraisal. And uh, the house was in Temecula. Okay. They're like, hey, can you sell houses in Temecula? I'm like, looking at my phone. I'm like, yeah, of course. I'm like, where is Temecula? <laughs> yeah. You're like, I I'm think like, so. <laughs> two hours away, I can do that. Yeah. So first house I ever sold was in Temecula. Um, and whenever I'm going out to like Palm Springs, I drive by that house. I always like right. go and look at the house yeah. that I first sold. Nostalgia. It's really pretty. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably worth like 800 Oh, now. it's probably worth way more so than So I'm still when you friends with it. the people and uh, keep in contact. So if that ever goes up, I'm going to list that house. Um, and then sold eight other houses that year. And I said that like can do attitude. Like I just like go, go, go. And after that first one, they're like, oh, this house isn't going to appraise or it didn't appraise. It's not going to go through. And I'm like, yeah, I'll make it work. The sellers lowered the price by 75 grand and it went through. Ah. Um, which apparently now I know. Yeah. That's not going to work. Yeah. I'd say the same thing, <laughs> but it worked out for me. Uh, and then another thing was I was selling a house online on Facebook and they're like, oh, you're never going to sell a house on the internet. You need to go out there and meet people. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Sold the house on Facebook. Uh, so after that, I was like, okay, I'm going to go work for this team. 
the the team I actually joined. So okay. that's where I kind of learned everything. And you you might know him. His name is Jesse Zagorski. Jesse, yeah, Jesse's yeah. a good guy. Shout out to Jesse. So Jesse What's Zagorski up, is one of the smartest people in real estate. Definitely. I learned everything I know from that guy, so I own my life. Very cool. Um, I was on his team. I was, I think I was probably one of his best buyers agents. Okay. Um, so you, from was him. that the first nine were on his team? No, the, well, like the first like three were probably at that brokerage, like a big okay. company. Okay. They're no longer around. Got it. Um, but it was downtown San Diego. Worked for them. It was kind of like, you know, when you see like a really nice office and you think the big name and all that stuff, well, they're no longer around and it's not about the big name. Yeah. And it's not and about the office. the fancy the office is gone. <laughs> yeah, and the fancy office is gone because right. their rent was probably 30000 a month. Right. Uh, and I went to this place that had no office, Jesse, but he had all the brains and he taught me everything. And I just was a sponge and I practiced and I role played and I script and I studied and I just did everything he told me to do. And I am still like, I'm super stubborn to Jesse. I'm surprised I was actually that coachable. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I'm always like, well, we can do it this way. And I'm like, what do I know? But, uh, Jesse and I together, like really created, and I always want to say like, I want to work with Jesse in some form or another yeah. again in life, but he's a great guy. And after that, I worked with him, started my team underneath him. Okay. And then I moved it to Big Block. Okay, cool. So um, how was it starting your team? Like, if I look back now, I actually ran into a girl that was on the first, like, so I've had one team this whole time. But uh, of the people, I think, like, I don't think one person is still on the team that was. From the original. From the original crew. Yeah, it definitely has, like, changed and adjusted mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like it, i think the biggest thing that i've i learned from it was just like learning from my peers who have done it before me right so like some of my best people that i know is through my coaching program and i just meet other team leaders that are just crushing it and have been really just been focused on like networking with them yeah and just saying hey what's working for you what's working for you hey this is what's working for me and sharing ideas yeah and yeah. from that i've really like revitalized my team changed it it's probably like on version six and it sounds like now maybe you found the formula. For sure. Yeah. yeah. In the beginning, it was really tough because if you're the one that knows how to sell and you're trying to teach people how to sell, it's not like a teachable thing. Right. It's a personality type and it's the skills and it's the education. So it's like, who do you hire? You don't know. Right. So what was the decision process like for you? Because I know a lot of people, they kind of question the, do I want to do the solo thing and just have an assistant versus do I want to have a team? and have to manage and train and all that. What was the decider for you to go one way or the other? You know, if I, it was actually someone that I met um, at a conference. She joined our brokerage and started a team. And then she's like, hey, you should be doing this with us. Uh, and so I kind of jumped in and I kind of inherited the team. I didn't even start it really. Okay. Um, that's how I got kind of, I want to say like finagled in. If I had to do it again, I don't think I would. I think I'd be a solo agent because there were so many months in the very beginning where I was negative, where I was, mm. I mean, I was making my own money and I was, I was covering the bills, right. but the bills were being a lot more than what my sales were. So I was only making like a part of it. So the team wasn't profitable at first. No, not at all. And like, I think a lot of people focus on that and they're like, oh, this team, this team. And I'm like, yeah, but are they profitable? Right. Like show me their numbers. Right. Oh, they spend that much on Zillow and they have that conversion. I mean, they're losing money on that. Like I know the numbers now, right. but when you start out, you don't know. And so now I'm crazy profitable. Yeah. Um, it's like through the roof on profitability on what it was though is like, because also as agents, look how many calls we get from like different companies and, oh, this is the new platform and this works mm -hmm. and you're just trying everything and yep. you like pay the $600 sign up fee and you right. try it out right. and you're like, oh, it sucked. Why and then you have three that? softwares that do the same thing. And you yeah, don't, you know? yeah, exactly. And then you don't know it's So now I'm like in my groove. Okay. I'm excited. Like 2019, we're going to kill it. But I wonder like 2020, I don't know. Who knows? What was the difference maker and the shift that made you more profitable versus just getting by or maybe even being negative? Yeah. So one is conversion. So definitely online leads is still a big, huge part of us, but also finding out which online leads work for San Diego. Right. So when you're in these cities and you meet people and they're in random parts of Texas and they're like, you know, my number one thing is Zillow and blah, 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 and Facebook and pay-per-click. And you're like, Okay, so you try it out and then you realize pay-per-click in San Diego doesn't work. And I don't have SEO like five other, you know, the five other, right. other people that have been doing this for years yeah. and to compete with them, it's just unreal. Mm -hmm. um, but when you don't know, you don't know. I right. mean, I'm a real estate agent. I'm not head of marketing and I don't And you're an it. entrepreneur, so you're just going to try stuff. <laughs> yes, I want to. <laughs> yeah. But also I can't like have the money to hire someone for marketing that knows it. Yep. So I'm just doing everything on a whim. And then finally something sticks and I look and I, the biggest thing is tracking and measuring. So finding what works 
and then just double down on what works and things are going to change. Like Zillow changed their platform. So I pulled all my money from there. Um, Realtor.com, I think is changing their platform. Like, so right. I mean, I don't have anything there, but like if the different ways that they're always changing. So mm -hmm. just stay on top of your game and, and just measure and just be like, Hey, am I profitable? I'm, I'm spending $15,000 a month on Zillow, which I was spending 18,000 a month. Um, we were making money, right? We were for sure making money. Yeah. But if you're looking at it and you're like, wow, if I took that 18,000 and put it towards this, I could be making 75,000. So right. let's do that. You know, and this is just my split because the agents are getting a split and then I'm getting it, but I'm having to pay for something. You got to take that all into consideration. Totally. And then the ones you close on your own, it's like, well, if you're going to start closing your online leads on your own, go be a solo agent. Right. I don't know. Yeah. At that point, like, I don't know if, if you're running me. around. Right. Yeah. You shouldn't be running around doing sales if that if you're at that point. And what was the tipping point where you were like, wow, like now we're, this is really happening and we're making money and things are things are looking uh, good. When my checking account just started going crazy. OK. No, uh, <laughs> when I was like, oh, wow, this is great. Uh, like probably like a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. OK. Um, but yeah, just like realizing that, you know, your actions are like finally paying off because for a while, you know, when you're doing something, and you're like, am I doing this right? right. Am I doing this right? And your mind, your mind just wants to kind of doubt you and make you quit. Yep. But you just stick to it. I mean, if you ask any of the agents or like the big teams at Big Block, ask like Christy and Phil and them. I'm like, ask them how many times I was like, do you want my team? <laughs> yeah. I'd call Christy and be no, like, I believe it. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Because it's tough. And, and, you know, there's there's babysitting. There's accountability. There's them calling you with questions all the time and all of that that you don't yeah. have to deal with as a solo agent and For worrying sure. about providing them leads and Making does this sure all cancel happy. out? Yeah. Is everyone happy? going to leave and then right. it's going to make you feel depressed because it's like yeah. you're getting dumped and you're like, well, wait, did not provide value? What's going totally. on? So how do you deal with that when that happens? Uh, well, I've, thankfully I've never lost, like I said, I've never lost like a huge key player. So that's great. Um, I that mean, but I never, but I also never had like really any huge key players. I, I do for sure. But I mean, I didn't have like very many in the beginning because right. we're all new. Um, and I wouldn't even consider myself like a huge key player. Like I said, I, I'll probably only sell like 20 houses this year. Um, okay. You're doing 20 out of the 250. Yeah, probably. Wow. I sold one today. Good for you. Congrats. <laughs> yeah. Cheers to that. Mine's all, the biggest thing is your sphere of influence, you know, like keep in contact with your sphere of influence, provide yeah. value to them using Facebook. Facebook is key. Like keeping in touch with people, doing a so, letter. Okay. So I was actually, the next question I was going to ask you is where is most of your business coming from? All mine is almost like 95% of my business is past client sphere of influence. Is that for the whole team or is that's that just, just you personally? That's just me personally. Okay. Um, I would say that my number one agent, her business is for sure sphere of influence. She was taking, so one thing is you're on a team, promote the team. Right. She's taking sales from the team, posting those. She's posting hers. She's very popular in San Diego. I think she's born and raised here, but um, everybody knows her and everybody loves her. So like her sphere of influence is just buying houses like crazy mm -hmm. left and right and selling houses. And okay. so she's really milked that. So for you, it's your sphere. For your top agent, it's sphere. sphere. What is it for uh, everybody else? Online leads and okay. then open houses we're really good at. So we would definitely have a high conversion. Um, if you have five people come to your open house, we're going to have a closing. Five people, you're having a closing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's let me the best. Like when I have agents that are yeah. new and they're like, only three people showed up. I'm like, how many escrows do you have? And they're like, well, only three people showed up. I'm like, I would have had three new clients. Yeah. So you're doing something wrong. Three's so tell great. me about that because I think that's really impressive. Like, what are you doing at the open houses that's education that's and doubt. helping you do that? Okay. So educating the client in a fun way and doubt if they have an agent because more than likely there's however many agents in San Diego County they have an agent, or they've spoken to an agent and it is their agent even though they don't even know their last name. <laughs> um, you know. Doing that and providing doubt about their process will really make them like you, but without being condescending to them or the other agent. Okay. Like, never talk crap about another agent in an open house. Yep. It makes you look bad. It makes the industry look bad, and it makes you look bad. Yeah. <laughs> so it just makes you look like an idiot. Talk bad about the process. Like make them fear the process of like losing their EMD or choosing the wrong bank because you know that getting their offer accepted. So walk me through how you do those things uh so like first first keyword when they walk in say hey how'd you hear about the open house i don't care how well i mean i care how they hear about the open house because i want to know if they're a neighbor if they're right. a seller right uh because if they saw the signs if they said oh i saw it online usually that means that they've been looking a while because they're actively looking on the apps yep um and more than likely and actually be, showing up not yeah. just looking but they're there so they're pretty far along in the process they've been right. looking they probably have an agent and their agent doesn't come 
Um, and then the other one would be uh, signs. That just means you're kind of walking around the neighborhood, and that's more like looky loos. Like we were grabbing brunch and we saw your sign. Right. Okay. Um, so those are the kind of three indicators, and it knows what level they're at. So if they're looking, they're like, oh, well, you have, you've got, you found it online. Be like, oh, you probably know more about this house than I do. Um, and then don't be a helicopter parent. Don't follow them around the listing. Yep. Just let them go be their thing and just say, hey, just let me know what you think when you come back. I usually will like have great conversation with people and get them to warm up immediately. Mm -hmm. So like body language, NLP, if you've ever done NLP, if you don't know what it is, yep. look it up. Uh, Neuro linguistic programming. So open body language, smile, like using your hand for, I probably sit my microphone for, you know, when you find an agent to work with. Yeah. You're saying me. So that when you thing. find a great agent to work yeah. with, not one of those other agents. Yeah, when you find a San Diego <laughs> agent, one of the top San Diego agents. I don't even think <laughs> I have it. But no. Love it. <laughs> uh, no. So you do that kind of stuff, and that makes someone want to work with you. But I would say, like, you know, how'd you hear about the house? And they're like, oh, so you've probably been looking a while if it's been someone shopping on Redfin. Great. Oh, six months. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. S three months. Wow, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. It's creating doubt. They're like, shit, whoa, is that a long time? Yeah. Wow, wait a minute. So okay. you start that off and then you're going to go into more, um, you have a, a book. So you're going to take a book and it's a binder and you're going to have every single like flip property in the neighborhood. So get together with all the flippers in San Diego. You'll print off all their weekly inventory and you'll have a book that says off market inventory. And you'll put that on the counter and say, well, so are you just looking at stuff that the app or is your agent sending you properties or what? And they're like, oh, no, our agent's sending us properties. And like, oh, just like MLS sheets or what? And they're like, yeah. Like, so is your agent not showing you any properties that are off market? Oh, that's so good. So <laughs> off market is a gold brick. You want to do that. It's something that you have that Redfin doesn't have, that Zillow doesn't have, that their agent doesn't have. Love that. And they're like, what do you mean you have off market? And you actually, this is NLP. Sorry, this is his book. but Love it. So this is my off market book. And I would take it from the counter and be like, well, this is all of our off-market properties, so we we can't give this out, but I would love to share it with you. I mean, what kind of house are you looking for? And then you just look down and start flipping through all of the pages of all your off-market houses. And they're like, wait, those wait, are houses have I those? haven't seen right. because I've been on Redfin for 17 hours a day flipping through the same houses. Yep. So that's that's, a great that's, your, that's your key. Uh, another one is, is they say which bank they're working for or working with, and I'm like, well, have you written any offers? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, here's the thing. If you work with X bank, like, if I'm the listing agent, and I don't know the, the banker, that loan officer there, like it's it doesn't look good. Like a big bank is not necessarily a good thing. So make sure you take that into consideration. It's not just about rate because you'll be shopping for six months and the rates may go up and you just lost out on buying a house six months ago, mm. which could have been 3% less in uh, increase in pricing. You know, So yeah. your rate that you're curious about at Bank of America may not be the best rate for you. That's good, that's so more doubt. I do that kind of stuff. Um, and then definitely never like helicopter, never tell them about the house. It's not about the house. They're not gonna buy that house. Maybe they will and someone's gonna write, oh, I sold the house at an open house. Okay. Great, yeah. but 99% of the time, it's just getting that client to go to somewhere else. And then <clears throat> that's what I was gonna ask next is what's your conversion process from taking them from a looky-loo yep. looky in your open house? Well, it's, they know they're not gonna buy it. You know they're probably not gonna buy it. So it's LP Mama. So you, if you know the script for LP Mama, it's location, price, motivation, uh, Agent, so do they have an agent? Mortgage, do they have a company that they're working with for a loan? And then appointment is the last day. So you always wanna have that appointment. So at the open house, I will know of three to four other vacant listings in the area or ones that I could possibly show. And they may not be the similar. So if I'm doing a three bed, two bath, I'll have a two bed, one bath, and I'll have a four bed, and I'll have another three bed. And I'm like, well, have you seen the one on 123 Main Street that just came on? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, I'm done here at four. What I'll do is I'll close up this. I'm gonna meet you down at 123 Main Street at four o'clock. You're not asking them to meet them. Oh, are you free? Mm, assuming the Pause. same. Yeah, you're just like, well, I'm just gonna meet you there because you're gonna wanna see this house. It's freaking awesome. It's better than this one, but I can't say that because I'm in this seller's house. Mm. Um, and then you meet them and then be like, you know, in the meantime, I'm gonna set you up on some search because I love those sites that you're looking on, but they're not 100% accurate. My search is syndicated with the MLS. It's gonna send you listings every hour or whenever. If you're looking right now, I'm gonna send them the second they hit the market, it's gonna tap you. That's great. Yeah. And what if, uh, what about if they say I have an agent? Then it's more doubt stuff. So like using the off-market properties, wow, you've been looking for four months. Wow, that's a long time. Mm. Like, where's your agent right now? <laughs> so I would Great literally question. be like, no, I like peek Great out the question. door and be like, is your agent coming in? And <laughs> they're like- I don't see them And mind you, anywhere. I send people to open houses all the time without me. Yeah. But I act like, why are you here without your agent? Like, is your agent not working for you? Yeah. That's good. So, I mean, sorry, I probably stolen some of your clients. Yeah. No, just kidding, no. Maybe you should have gone with them to the open house. Uh, exactly. <laughs> well, that's the best is like, so the off-market property thing, 
um, and really setting that appointment right then and there. Like you cannot be pushy. You can't be asking for the appointment because that's pushy and salesy. Mm -hmm. You have to just assume the close and just say like, hey, you know what, at four o'clock I'm done here. I'm gonna pick up my signs and I'm just gonna meet you at one, two, three Main Street. It's, the, it's a three bed, two bath, it's super nice. Um, I'll see you there at four, sound good, perfect. And you know it's vacant, so you don't have to worry have about anything, ready. and just it's ready to go. Yeah, and you print all the inventory out so it shows, and actually tour it and know it. So if you're doing open houses, what I love was like you're an agent in San Diego, and you live in 92101 downtown, and you're freaking doing an open house in Oceanside just because. I'm like, why? Yeah. Like you just wasted freaking eight hours of your day. Mm -hmm. Do you know the inventory? Like I don't know. The only road I know in Oceanside is I-5. <laughs> like, that is the only road right. I know that's up there. Yep. So you're not gonna know the schools, you're not gonna, and, and the open house is about education. Like, oh yeah, Alice Bernie's right there. That school is a nine out of 10. This one over here, if you go on that side of the 805, it actually, the schools drop to about a four. Oh, wow. It's definitely That's changing, good. but if your kid is two, I would say go for it. If your kid's five and has to go to preschool there, I don't know. Like, right. you gotta take that into consideration. That might be a different story. But if you have that information and they're like, oh my gosh, we gotta buy a house, you know. The other one that's really good, if you're a Temecula <laughs> agent, use your tax rates. So you gotta know, because in okay. Temecula, it's taxes can be different across the street for the okay. schooling. Like one will be 2% and one will be like 1%, I think. That's I don't know Temecula yeah. all that yeah. well, but it was an agent telling me about that. Here, you can be like, well, the taxes in this area are 1.25. The taxes over there, especially knowing which neighborhoods have mellow. Mellow yeah, and like, not, yep. Yeah, and knowing the story about Mellow Roos, Like I went on a listing appointment. Uh, I think it's Jim Mello and Mike Roos. Like knowing those people and knowing the little history behind it, it's fun. To spout out a little bit. Yeah, like chat with it. The guy was a freaking, uh, what was he? He was a lobbyist. Uh, and he was friends with those guys and he was friends with um, someone else. It was someone, oh, uh, Jim Mills, like Millzack. So we can thank them all for higher prices? Well, I was thinking, I was like, you want to be Jim Mills, but you don't want to be Henry Mello or whatever his name <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah. And the guy was laughing. He was like Classic. an old, like 80 year old man. Right. So I did not get the listing. Damn. Wow. Can't win them all, I guess. I know. Yeah, I hadn't sold a house in Coronado before, and he was set on having an agent that sold a home in Coronado. Mm. I was like, I'll co-list it. Let's do it. Oh, that's a good shift. Yeah, I was like, yeah, well, let's not? just co-list it. I'll find the best agent in Coronado, and then I'll tell you everything that they did wrong during the transaction. And then we'll take over from there. <laughs> yeah, but we'll split the, I'll split the commission. Yeah, of course, of course. So um, what about <coughs> some of your processes on the back end? Like you said, sphere of influence is your biggest... Um, source yep. for you and for your some of your team members and then portal leads for the rest yep yeah. and is that just mainly leads you're buying the yeah, Zillow's, online leads the randoms yeah. okay cool how are you having them because it sounds like you're really big on conversions yes so i'm guessing you're tracking phone calls appointments no uh not now we okay. were though okay. but now my top seven are pretty good at it so what we do is really is just like, if you are on, um, so we do lead shifts. So because there's a way that you can distribute leads and it's not necessarily the best way to do it because someone may be at the gym, mm -hmm. someone may be driving and then they're gonna answer and they're not gonna do what they should be doing. Right. So we do lead shifts so that when someone answers the phone, they're at a desk and they have their computer open and they can create the search for them. Great. They can talk more about the situation versus like doing other stuff. Um, and our conversion has gone up a lot. So. All of our shifts are covered from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. So we do three shifts a day. 9 to 6, Monday through Friday, and those are four-hour shifts-ish, uh, three yeah, hours? Yeah, it's like 9 to noon, noon to 3, 3 to 6, three hours. And shifts. how are you facilitating that? So we let best agent that has the most closings go first. They pick five shifts, um, and then the next person picks five shifts, the okay. next, and then whatever's left. Okay. And then is there like a company phone that's getting handed around? Yeah, or? well, it, that, and then also there's a, um, everything's routed to them through our CRM. Okay, cool. Yeah. And what CRM is that? Boomtown. Boomtown, okay, yeah. cool. You also mentioned that you have a coach. Yep. Who's your coach? Tom Ferry. Tom uh, Ferry, okay. So he's not my actual coach, he's the coaching company. Okay. Um, but I did text Tom that I bought my new house that he told me to buy. Awesome. And he's like, I'm so proud of you. Good for you. That's <laughs> so, the one in Kensington you were telling me about? Yes, yeah. Cool. So just closed on that house on Wednesday. But yeah, he's our coach. And that's just through our network that we've received a ton of just, you know, feedback and networking and learning from your peers. Yeah. Sharing. Yeah. If you share, people will share with you. Totally agree. And, uh, you know, we're also big on um, just the continued education thing, right? Like just get a coach, whether it's Tom Ferry, Buffini, Mike Ferry, whoever, Kevin Ward, whoever it is. Yeah. But like plug into something that you can network with other people, refer deals from other areas, share kind of secrets and, and 
help each other grow with that. So, um, and I'll say like a lot of people will complain about their coach. They're like, Oh, I don't like this coach. You'll see it in the forums occasionally. But I go, I don't like this coach and not the coaching program, but the actual individual coach. And I'd say like, stick with your coach for a while and then kind of go from there. Um, because it's definitely like, a Thank you. Appreciate you it. never know like who you're going to learn from. And my coach, like at first, I was so scared of my coach when they signed, they're like, well, you're going to get this person, this person to this person. I was like, Oh, please don't be the guy from long Island. That like scares me. And he's like the sweetest guy in the world. I've had him as a coach for two years. Uh, he's yeah. So like, just let your coach, I don't know. And what um, is he coaching you on now? Now it's more of the ideas that I have and then just like holding me to it. And yeah. then what he does great is like, you know, he's coaching tons of teams all around the country. He's going to take whatever's working for them and right. share it. Yeah. And so when people are like, wow, you, I can't pay, you know, I was paying 2,500 a month and people are like, I can't pay 2,500 a month. I'm like, yeah, you don't start there, but you right. graduate into it and your exactly. level of coaching gets higher and higher. So, I mean, like the Tom Ferry coaching or Mike Ferry coaching, I mean, it's like 500 bucks or 600 bucks when you start out, yep. hire a coach. Yeah. Like if you don't have a coach right now and if you're like, I can't afford a coach, you can't afford a coach because you don't have a coach. Yeah, it's true. Because they're not, to your point, they're not only going to push you and hold you accountable to doing what you're actually supposed to do every day, but they're going to be taking that information that other people are winning with in different markets and being able to give it to you yeah. to implement in your well, own I market. I test everything like I was doing in the beginning right. when you can have you know, 70 other team leaders right. that I'm like best friends with. I mean, yep. since I've got my house, I have a few guest rooms and they've been hitting me up like, I'm coming out. Yeah, like, so totally. like my friend Adam has 30 something units and he lives in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. He has 30 units in the Bay Area. That's and great. some of them are like, or I'm sorry, 30 buildings. Right. Some of them are like 30 units. And the guy's like killing it. Wow. And he comes down, he shares me all of his freaking analytics of how he yep. analyzes a property. Yep. And half the time it's over my head. Yeah. But like, it's yeah, you got to You got to be around people that are doing bigger things than you is the bottom line. In yeah. my opinion, I I'm always that. the loser in my group. Yeah. And that's the best, no. best person to be. Cause it's then funny, but then you start growing and you're like, Oh man, I'm like growing yep. with them. Yeah. It's interesting how that works. People bring you up for sure. And people love having people. Like if I have people that are willing to learn and hey, there's nothing better than that, like right. bringing people up, around me or like helping someone new out like a, a young person who wants to learn about real estate if they really want to work their butt off yep i'll teach them everything yeah yeah once you get to a certain stage you're almost looking for people like that like you want those younger hungrier people not even younger necessarily but just that have the hunger and want to do it yeah and if you've already done it you can show them the way i mean it's a no-brainer well the coolest thing is i was like I was hearing a conversation go on. It was one of the agents on my team and he was talking about me, but I don't think he knew I was there. He was like, well, my real estate mentor. And I was like, oh. Nice. I'm like, yeah, mentor, that's like pretty teaching cool. him life, real right. estate, which yeah. is, I've had so many people do that to me. Yep. It feels great. Like, and if anyone's not willing to share, like. It's, Change your situation. Yeah, get, get a different mindset. Change your team, your brokerage, whatever you got to do, get out of that. For yeah. sure. So right now in your business, what are like your top three or top tools softwares kind of things that apps that help you run your business that you just can't live without or that you love or you're excited yeah. about uh so for organization or like my to-do list i use trello okay um, a lot of people actually use it for transaction management so you can put on like templates and everything uh, it's free so mm -hmm. i love free stuff love it because <laughs> uh, when you start a team all those expenses add up yeah uh, another one is broker mint um, okay. we use that for more transaction management Okay. It's kind of like back agent, but I would say it's more, it's smaller. Like it's like for like an individual and you can set dates and timelines. Mm -hmm. Really helps out with staying on track of that. Okay. Um, back agent probably does the same things. I just so is that the software that is helping you run your transactions the same way every time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it'll tell us like you type in a date and it like auto inputs like all the dates for your escrow timeline. Everything. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So that's called broker mint. Um, and I'd say like Facebook sounds cheesy, but you got to use Facebook. And I'm not talking about paid ads. I'm talking about sphere of influence. Like, and, and not just going on there and just like trolling at nine o'clock at night till three in the morning. Like I'm talking about like, you know, going in and having intention. So on my calendar, every single like Monday, I believe it's Monday morning or no, Tuesday morning. It says Facebook, Instagram stock. And I know that hour, all I'm supposed to do is go to this group and like find these certain people that I work with that are kind of like mentors and also like um, they, they, own, they're, they own really big companies. Okay. So I just need to go on there and comment on their photos. So that's all I do for an hour every Tuesday morning. Wow. Um, and I, so it's I, an I, intent. Like I know exactly yeah. whose pages I'm going to. I know whose Instagram I'm going to and I've got my list and I go on and I comment and like photos and I'll do it throughout whenever I'm on there. 
but I for sure touch those people every single time. So are those your A's? Would you consider yes. like yeah, okay. like your clients and your people that are like your big referral partners? Yeah, you for sure. So go on I those. want to talk more about this because this is the third time you brought up Facebook and your sphere of influence. So I want to talk about how you're doing that, right? With the intention that you just mentioned, like what are some things that you're doing to leverage Facebook to get business from your sphere? So the yeah. liking and commenting. One's another one's a custom audience. So you take every email of your past clients, your clients, your sphere of influence, and you upload it to uh, Facebook and then you create an ad and you would do that every single month, change it up, okay. provide value, do a video, do a thing. So you'd see me following you around for a month. And what and does that ad look cheap. like or what does it sound like? Uh, one would be like, thanks for making me top 1% in San Diego County for SDAR, San Diego Association of Realtors. I look forward to helping you in 2019. Okay. Um, that was my 2018 January or 2019 January post. Okay. Um, and that followed all my SOI around for a month. And, and like, so people you're would doing- be like, oh my gosh, like they'd be like, I saw you on Facebook. Like people don't even realize it's sponsored sometimes. Right. Cause it's just like a headshot of me. Yeah. So, um, you're posting that on your business page. It's yeah, a video. Uh, it's just in, well, it's, get, it's in my ad. Okay. So it's like you go to your ads on your personal page. Yep. I rarely use my business page. Okay. I just go to my personal page and then create an ad, but my Facebook ad does it for me. Okay, cool. And um, it sounds like it's not really buy or sell. No, 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 type nothing. Pitching. I'm not it's more at all. like, okay. So tell me more about that. What I just come from service. So I'll be like, hey, you know, I like a lot of times I have a meeting today. At, uh, they were first time buyers. They bought a house from me three years ago. They've lived in that home. And now they've been kind of questioning me about investment properties because they see all my investments. Yep. They're like, how do we do this? So we're sitting down and putting together a plan. Great. So that's just someone who they've been targeted to yep. for three years. Okay. I also take them out on events and like my aid clients, the ones that refer me people, like I make sure that I invite them to either like, you know, shows in the city or Padres tickets or mm. I'm like, yeah, I got these extra Padres tickets and I'll just like shoot them over to them. That's great. Um, so just taking care of your clients. And are those one-on-one style, um, th- like you go to Padre game or are you taking like a big group of people? No, yeah, it wouldn't even be with me. I'd be like, hey, I have two tickets, go. Oh, okay. They don't want to go to the game with me. Okay, cool. So it's more just like, But we love Mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I don't want to go. But Mark hooked it up, so yeah. he's my boy. Yeah, so I'll just give like tickets out or uh, to different stuff. Okay. And anything else on the on the Facebook notes? So- we do. So I have a porch light preferred client, so it's a group that's just our past clients. Um, so like say my client needs a barbecue that he's going to get rid of. I'll post it in there be like, Hey, who wants a free barbecue? Mm-hmm. So it's giving it to our past clients. Awesome. So like who wants this TV or Hey, anybody know of a good service for this? And then like people chime in. So, so that's a, just a private network of your fa- uh, of past, all of our clients. past clients. And that's a, just a Facebook group. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, it's and another then another good, one is another we do a happy team. hour, um, every, every quarter. Okay. So we'll do a happy hour at our office and we do like, um, one thing is huge is reviews. So we'll have people that'll come in and like for a drink ticket, they'll get a review. Uh, you have to write a review and then you get a drink ticket. Oh my God, we're stealing that. That's so good. Yeah, so you, if they're like, but I've so already written a review up, and I'm like, use another email. <laughs> no way, <laughs> or, that's great. Or uh, write a review on Facebook or write a review on Google. If you look at Zillow, we're the fifth most reviewed team in all of San Diego County. So you're actually having them do it in, they come to your event. There's iPads. Well, we You've want got the, the we ethical want them, bribe. Hey, do this for a drink. Well, we want them to use their phones because it's all based off IP address. Okay. So don't have them do it on an iPad and don't write the review for them. Like, and these are all past clients. So like, hey, right. write us a review. Oh, I, oh, I never did because they're moving or something. Um, best time to ask for a review too is after contingency removal periods before they start moving. Mm-hmm. Don't wait till close of escrow because they're busy. Smart. So you ask them after you remove contingencies, then you ask them for a review. Hey, look, now we're at the finish line. We're just waiting for those last seven days right. or whatever amount left. They've gone through it all. Yeah. They know the Will drill. Will you write me a review on Zillow? They're not dealing with the craziness of moving quite yet. Yeah. Love That's that. That's the best time. But if they didn't write a review then, hit them up again. And I always feel bad. I'm like, can you write us a review on Yelp and Zillow and Facebook and Google and what's the other one? Realtor.com? Yeah. We have, yeah, five sites now. So um, I took them all and put them all up. And so when people come in, they can write us reviews. That's great. We're stealing that. That's really good. Right. But if you work on like one little part of your business every month, little by little, you'll you'll be a badass. Just keep getting a little bit better. And then it'll change. No. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah. Then it'll be like, oh, you can't do that anymore. You're like, geez, I just got that system down. But so those those are those are some great tips. Um, I think the private client Facebook group is awesome. Past clients in yes. your Facebook group. Um, I love the idea of of ethical bribes for testimonials. Yep. And I love the idea of running an ad every month to your 
to your custom audience of Sphere and it's super past cheap. clients. It's yeah. like you can run an ad to like 150 people for like a few dollars a day, right. like right. a dollar a day or something. Yep. Yeah, versus doing like a blanket ad to people that don't even know you. And then or to other real estate agents. Like I get other people's ads and I'm like, why are you That's targeting That's hilarious. Me? Yeah, I, I get a kick out of that too. Um, are you putting any calls to action in those at all? Or is no. it very, I never, I, I'm like, just here. They always have like the CTAs, the call to actions. But I mean, I'm not like that, like that's what's told to do. But that's just not my personality. Mm -hmm. So I'm more of like, hey, I'm just here. I'm just kicking butt. Yeah. Little, like subtle. Like, and then grind. here I am again. I'm yeah, here yeah. again. Look, Still here. <laughs> just sold this house. Like, yeah. I just want them to think real estate, Mark Patterson. Yep. Like, I want other agents to think that too. Yep. And then any other tips just on, um, like posting, what people should be posting, what they shouldn't be posting. Uh, yeah, don't get confrontational on Facebook. You're never gonna change someone's political views. Don't post things that you don't agree with. Don't write negative things on like lab code agents because I, you people see that and clients see that and it just looks really bad on your behalf. Right. Like you're never gonna. I don't know. And when people yeah. call people stupid or that, it just makes you look like an ass. Yeah. And don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do say. that in an everyday conversation, so you probably shouldn't do it on Facebook and That's either. something my coach taught me is that um, uh, Facebook is an everyday conversation. So if someone says, hey, great view or whatever, you don't like it because you're never going to be like, hey, say great shirt. And you'd be like, <laughs> you comment back and yeah. you'll get more engagement that way. So yeah. that's something that you can do. Cool. Well, so speaking of Facebook, I actually, like I was telling you earlier, I posted on Facebook that we were going to be doing this interview and uh, let people see if they had any other questions. And this one came from Carrie Schulp. She's a really badass uh, agent in DC. And um, she asks, what would you say are your daily habits for success? Yeah, um, one of the things that I, I would say is that I use my calendar like it is the back of my hand. So I'm gonna be on that thing 300 times a day, checking it, making sure that I'm on it. Um, and anything that I need to do, and I color coat my calendar. So if it's something I have to be somewhere, it's red. If it makes me money, it's green. Um, and then if it's just something that I have to do that day, if it's not like for sure I have to do it that day, I'll put it on my calendar though, I'll allocate time. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's not there, it's like my to-do list. So yeah. I take my Trello items, like my items that I wanna do, and I move them to my calendar. Mm. So because if you're not blocking time off for these things that you have to do, you are, you're thinking things don't take as much time as they truly do. Yeah. And then you never get anything done. Right. The other thing is I'd say is take three things a day and make sure you accomplish them. I love it. So that. if you're working on projects or building something, you know, and reading, education, all that good stuff, but like take three things a day and make sure you accomplish those at least. I love the three things a day because it's so easy to do. Anybody can implement it. And uh, speaking of Sharon, something that Sharon taught us is, is planning your day in advance. So... Yeah, Plan the night before. The night before, yep. just write down the three things that you're going to do tomorrow and make sure you're getting those done. Mine is definitely, uh, like, this is my calendar for today. So, like, every single thing. There's a lot of green, thing, so those are making you money. Well, this is actually not the green. This is okay. just the way Apple does their thing, but on my desktop, it's colored. Got it. Um, so, once I finish something, though, I delete it off my calendar. And at the end of the day, if I didn't finish something, I drag it over. And it goes to my next day. Oh, you just, and so then like, yeah, until I can sense. fill it up, like, or until I can get it all done. So like, there's times when people are like, oh, I don't know what to it's do. It's just going to linger. It's just always there. Yeah. And so if I know, if I look at the next day, I'm like, well, I got to wake up at 4.30. Like I need to hit the ground running at 5 a.m. because I got so much I need to accomplish. It's a really good way to do and it. And so by 8 a.m., I can probably get like 30 of those things that are on there just like off my calendar. Yep. Love that. Um, Great tip. And then you time it so that like, if it's something that has to wait till 8 a.m., like I had to call a pool guy and I had to call a landscaping guy because I moved in a new house. Yep. Um, I had to wait till 8 a.m. You're not so doing that at that. 6, yeah. So right at 8 o'clock, I called them. Yeah. yeah. Good. So you I just have that. like, just make sure you do that kind of stuff. And, it, and who's managing your calendar? Just you? Or? I do. I don't have an assistant. Okay. So uh, we have one admin on my team and she's not even an employee. She's just our TC. Wow. So all of us do our own stuff. So we're doing that many deals and managing it all on our own. That's incredible. Yeah. But I am looking for an assistant, like I said. Yeah. I've been interviewing, but I'm going to be super picky this time and really go with the right hire. I think you should. Sometimes be. I'm too empathetic and I go for it and I'm like, I'll try to help someone out and uh, change their that. life. I do love changing people's lives, though. That's the best I do feeling. love changing people's lives as well. But I'm going to share one Mike Ferry quote that's one of my all-time favorite quotes. It's, we're not saving the manatees. So when you're looking to hire people, we're not saving the manatees. You need to find the best person 
for you that's going to add the most value, that's going to buy into your vision, yep. that's going to fit the culture, and don't think about anything else. No, yeah. My last hire didn't know anything about real estate. I taught her everything, and now she's killing it. And now she's going to be an agent on my team. So yeah. she's our eighth agent that's going to be. She's that's our great. transaction coordinator. Great. One yeah. thing we talk about every time is uh, credit scores. So like we'll go in like every meeting. We know each other's credit scores. Really? Yeah. It's voluntary, but everyone wow. volunteers. We're family. One that's... girl's credit score is going up like 100 points, and she's, joined, and she's been on the team for like six months. And why are you doing that? Because credit score is the easiest way to wealth. If you have bad credit, totally you're going to pay more for everything. Yeah. And so I car loan, cell phone bill, everything, everything, everything more. And so get your credit score in order because you don't have to be a rocket science to do it. You just have to pay attention. And if it's something up in visual in your face every day, improve my credit score, improve my credit score, improve my credit score. Your credit score is going to go up. Who's got the highest score? I probably do. No, (laughs) uh, I like eight something. Eight forty was my last one. But when they pulled for the thing, it was like 800. Very cool. But no, uh, the the agents all actually have really high credit because none of them have car payments. Like, they're all paying off their cars. Yeah. I love it. And I love how you're you're kind of doing like the complete approach for your agents. It's, it's not just about the business. It's no. about. What's your split? I'm like, yeah. if you ask me what my split is, like <laughs> you're the wrong agent for the team. Totally. Trust me. I will make you rich. Totally. That's all you have to worry about is like, if you put the effort in, I will teach you how to be rich. Yep. Rich, relative work. I mean, we're making good money. Yeah. But I, it just, it sounds like you're just laying the complete financial I want to help. I want to help. Like if they're willing to do it, I love like, like it's, it's 